Why don't you, um, if you have your Word uh, Bible, whether it's on phone or paper or whatever you got, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 13 this morning. And um, this uh, last week we begin our series on the Father, replacing um, placing lies that we believe with truth. So I'm excited to continue that. Last week was, um, I think, a, a great Sunday that we looked at God as our good Father, who actually it was his, it says in um, it says that it's His good pleasure in Luke. It's good His good pleasure gives the kingdom. So we have a good Father who who loves us cares about us and desires to give us the kingdom of God, desires to give us all the kingdom represents. So this week, as I was studying, um, I thought I was going to, I thought I was just going to mess up the whole series and do a totally different sermon. And then God began to, God began to like um, show me how that the, the this message about the kingdom is also a message about who He is. That we have a Father in heaven who is a king. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. But I remember as a little kid, one of my favorite things to tell people was that my father was in the military. So, and, and, and when I would do that, we used to, as little boys around the military, um, we lived on a military base. And so we would always pretend to be like our fathers. We would do, we would go have like our little war things. We'd get our Nerf guns or our, our, or our water guns. And we'd go around, you know, fighting, fighting the bad guys in the neighborhood. And, and you know, restoring order and all this kind of stuff. And we really enjoyed the fact that our our dads were Marines and in commercials were really great. I don't know, I haven't seen any Marine Corps commercials lately, but you know, back um, when I was younger, I see the Marines pictures the commercials. You remember they had like the, the guy who was dressed in his, his blue, so they would have like some kind of combat scene going on, and then at the very end, it would show the show the guy who was in his dress blues, and then he had his little sword, and he would like lift up his sword right at the end. It's like this shining armor knight kind of. Oh, they, they, basically, for me, it was like my picture of what a knight in shining armor was. It was like the the typical marine look of the the, um, the navy blue and the, and the sword and everything. And so it was like it was just like mesmerizing to think. Oh, yeah, my dad is like a marine. He can kill anybody, you know. And I was like, that was a, another one of those thoughts that you have as a little, as a little kid. I don't know, maybe your your parents or maybe somebody who had a parent as a firefighter or, or a policeman. You know, you like thought you thought everything of them like that. They they're unstoppable. They're they're like this massive thing. And um, as I was as I was thinking about this week, thinking about the kingdom of God, that it was, it was God's good pleasure to give us a kingdom. As I thought about that for a moment, I said, well, if it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom, that must mean he, he has a kingdom to give us. That means that he he's actually is a king. And when I looked at um, Psalms 24, I said that Psalm 24 says that, that not only is he a king, but he's a king that, that has everything. It says, the earth is his and everything in it. And I'm like, wow. So, so it's not just... That's just that he comes to give us this imaginary kingdom. And we're going to talk about this kingdom and the qualities that it has today. But he, he, he rules over all things. And what's really important, and the reason why this week talking about the kingdom, building off last week, him being a good father who has good pleasure to give us the kingdom, is to know that if he is a good father, who, as we sung about this morning, even that he loves us, he cares about us, if he's that good father, that means that his kingdom, or his rule, or his reign, is also good. So we have a good father who is a king, but his kingdom is also good. So I should, I should desire his rule and reign. As, his, as, as a king, as my father, I should desire his rule and reign in my life. So let's look at Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 44 through 46. If you have time this week, I would encourage you to open up your Bible, whether it be on your phone app or whether it be a paper Bible that you have, and read through Matthew chapter 13. Um, Jesus spoke often in parables. So he would tell a story and and make make a he would make a point without making it directly saying it. And so Matthew 13 has a has a lot of different parables of Jesus telling how the kingdom was like, telling different stories. And we're going to look here specifically at one, maybe one of the shorter parables that Jesus makes, but I think it's going to make, help us make a great point about our Father, who is our King. So we're in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look at verses uh, 44 through 46. And 
it says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and he bought it. Let's pray this morning over the word. Father, we are so grateful for how good you are. And Father, we could just spend all day just praying and, and singing to you. But Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to come and gather around your word and to hear uh, truth this morning. Father, I pray that, that your truth would penetrate our hearts and that it would begin to change us. Father, we don't want to just be hearers of the word, but Father, we want to be doers of the word. We want to be changed by your word. So we pray that I pray that this morning as I, as I speak, Father, that my words would not be of my own understanding, of, of my own intuition, but Father, that it would come from you and that it would penetrate our hearts and transform us, that we may look more and more like you. Help our relationship with you as our Father to grow today. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a, this statement here. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid, hid it again, and then in his joy, he went out and sold all that he had and bought that field. So, he would, so his whole intention here, that I would sell everything that I have to buy the field. To me, when I was reading that this week, I was thinking about just the, okay, let me be honest. So my possessions, I could add up my possessions this morning, and it wouldn't be a very impressive um, sum of money to have all of my possessions uh, added up and sold. But the other day, Rachel and I were looking at, um, at adopting a child, and we were looking at one of the, one of the requirements for adopting a, a baby from China, and it said that we had to have a net worth of hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, "Well, I have hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. What I, mean. I, I could sell all my stuff. I own. But this value here, this statement here, is 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 more than just a. I think that more than just a statement of okay, how much monetary value could this man get in order to buy this field? But it's the it's it goes beyond that to say that he was willing that this man was willing to give up everything he had, anything that he held value to. So there are some possessions that Rachel and I find very valuable. Now, you know, our wedding bands, Rachel and I get to celebrate nine years in May, you know, and so for, for me and for, and for Rachel, and I think many of the married couples, they, as they probably say, you couldn't put a value on the wedding band. Like, that's something that was significant. It was something for, for me when I found Rachel's wedding ring. It was like I went in, like, incognito without her knowing. I went and searched searched a different Jewish door, I was like, I'm not even going to get her opinion on this. I thought that was a normal thing. I found out later, girls kind of liked their the opinion of what ring I got. Anyway, it worked out, she still liked it. But but there's an infinite value to this ring that I that I own, right? Maybe some of you guys may have a possession that you own, maybe something that was passed on to you from a family member. Maybe there, there's a, something that you've even created with your own hands or something. You're like, this, this, this thing, this, um, material thing, I couldn't, I couldn't even put value on it, but that is so valuable to me. And so this statement here that he's making, that he sold everything that he had for this field, was even more so than just the monetary value that he had, but it was, he, he was willing to get rid of any possession he had, so that he could get this field, because it, the treasure that was within it represented the kingdom. That's how valuable, that's how amazing the kingdom got him. But even further so, it encouraged me that he says that it was his joy to do so. Some, you know, some, and this is key, whether we're talking about God as our Father and Him as a King, but this is the key, I think, even in, in our relationship with the kingdom of God, our relationship with in Christ, our relationship as a believer, is that it's our joy when the King requires something of us, or, or when, when we're in relation with Him, it's, it's our joy to, to get rid of anything that He says get rid of, because it hates. I'm going to get something that's better. And if you don't believe it's better, today I hope through the scriptures we're going to see that the kingdom, what we gain in the kingdom of God, is better than anything we already possess. Whether it be something material, whether it be some kind of thing that's passed down, whether it be some, our own desires that we have, what the kingdom represents to us is something even greater, even better, that we should be and have joy when we give up. See, uh, let's see Philippians chapter 3. Verse 7 and 8, this is Paul's statement. Paul, he was a, 
was somebody that wrote a lot of the New Testament. He went and he planted churches and, and encouraged people to follow Jesus more. He gave lots of instructions. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, it, it gives a little picture into the cost that, uh, that Paul gave up. And Paul, he went through all sorts of different tormenting things for the sake of the kingdom. He was shipwrecked, put in prison, it said that he was beaten, left for dead, all these, all these miserable things. But this is what he says in uh, chapter 3 of Philippians, verse 7 and 8. He says, whatever gain I had, I count it lost for the sake of Christ. I count everything lost because it has, uh, because of the surpassing, because uh, of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. So this kingdom, this the kingdom that God gives to us, it has surpassing what oh, surpassing work. And I'm like, wow! I want to, I want to know, I want to know this kingdom. I want to receive this kingdom. And what's interesting about it too is that the Bible begins to reveal as we've studied the, the kingdom of God, this kingdom, this reign that our Father in heaven has. Is it's easy to receive. So it wasn't this passage here, Matthew chapter 13. He went and sold everything. It's not that we have to sell something, that we have to give up something, or, or somehow that we can gain it by bartering with God. Hey God, I'll give you, I'll give you ten of my good talents, and if you give me some of the kingdom of God, or hey God, I'll 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 sacrifice my marriage so that you know I can get the, the kingdom of God. It's not a bartering system in which we receive the kingdom of God. It's not something we pay him and then we get it back. Actually, it says that we are we receive the kingdom of God like a child. I love uh, I was worshiping this morning and Isaac came up and he stood in front of me, you know, and he's just like like standing in front of me, he's like had his hands on me, my little nephew, I'm like, it's so awesome, I love this dude. And then uh, he actually he really liked my mic too this morning. He wanted some of my mic. I wanted my mic. But you know, when, he, when it comes around Christmas time or birthday time or whatever, you ever you ever um, give a gift to a young child? Like how, what what is the how what is the reaction when they when you get a rap if you get a rap present in front of a young young kid, right? I suffer maybe some anyway. I'll, I'll tease a little bit my my sister's kids. They like really neatly sometimes really neatly unwrap the the present. I was like. I don't know what they're doing. I used to, I used to get in front of the, get the present and just rip it open, right? It's full of excitement. And then I've heard from other parents, I've heard from parents that sometimes the kids like the box more than the present. But you know, hey, they're they're just excited. Whatever they got, they, they get it. They're excited about it, right? So we receive the kingdom the same way as a child. We receive the kingdom with excitement. Let's see. Um, three three verses here talk about um, how the, how a child receives the kingdom. And, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says that the poor in spirit or the weak, they actually, re those are the ones that receive the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 10, verses 15, that it says that whoever does not receive it like a child can never enter the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, also says the, the, same, um, the same thing. It's really hard. I, I apologize. I wrote all my notes in my left hand. So I wrote the scripture out here and I can't even read it. So I'm going to turn. Matthew chapter 10, verse, verse, verse 8. Andrew, what was the scripture that you just gave before that one? Before that one was Mark chapter 10, verse 15. And that's not even the right one that I put here for Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. week I, I, I did my notes on my iPad and I think I just need to stick with that until I get my ability to write with my right hand again. So you'll have to forgive me. But the kingdom, the, the kingdom of God is this. I know we can, we can refer that from the first two uh, references which were correct. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 and Mark chapter 10 verse 
15, that, that we, cannot re, we cannot receive the kingdom of God unless we are like a child. Or Matthew 5 says that, that the poor in spirit, those who, those who are humble, are the ones that receive the kingdom of God. Last week, we referenced this, and I mentioned how good it was that our Father, it was His good pleasure in Luke chapter 12, it was His good pleasure to give us the kingdom. But sometimes, for us, if we're honest, sometimes we don't like the fact that our Father is, a, is, a, is actually a king, that He actually has a kingdom, that He actually rules over us. And it's sometimes like mystifying to us, like, oh no, like, what if, what if He requires something of me that I don't, that I don't want, that actually that would be harsh towards me. So we have an, an opportunity here is to see what the kingdom is like and really, I believe, begin to reframe our mindset to think, oh, the kingdom of God, His rule and reign, His, His fatherhood over me is good. So let's look here. How, does, how is the scriptures, what is, it, what is the kingdom like? What is our king and how does He establish it? What is it like? The three um, places that I... The three places I looked at, it's all in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 7, it talks about that the kingdom of God is like, there's a narrow path that leads to the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 19, it says that the, those that follow the king, that follow the commandments, they will inherit the kingdom of God. And in Matthew, again in Matthew chapter 5, it says that, it says this statement, and this statement sometimes for me was like really hard for me. It says that, that those that those that receive the kingdom of God, their righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. And like, when I'm, when I'm reading all of these, when I'm reading all these references, again, I kind of, if I'm honest, sometimes I get a little intimidated. Like, wow, there's, God is my king, and so now I have commandments, now I have, now, now there's this narrow way, this sounds hard, this sounds rough, my, my righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. Like, the Pharisees were pretty, like, strict dudes. They, they followed the law to the T, and I'm like, that, that sounds rough. How, God, why is your kingdom, why do you have to make your kingdom sound so terrible? You know, if, I, if I was a sales pitch man, right, I wouldn't want to, I would want to make, I would want to make his kingdom sound excellent. So I think we need to go back, let's look at Exodus, let's go old school a little bit, but I really like this because I think for a while we've looked at these Ten Commandments and say, oh, they're harsh, they're commandments, they're, that, that word even just makes me cringe. But let's re-look at these because I believe they give us a picture into what his kingdom would be like. So why would it why would it be that this this guy he sold everything he had to go get the kingdom if the kingdom sounds really harsh? Let's uh, maybe it is, I believe it's is that we have a wrong understanding of what his kingdom, what his commandments, what his rule is really like. So we're looking in Exodus chapter 20. <coughs> Well, look at these Ten Commandments. Does anybody, anybody with brownie, anybody want brownie points? Anybody get, get know how to like quote all the Ten Commandments? No, I, I couldn't even do it this morning. That's why I had to use a reference. I was like, oh, I missed a few. That was not good. All right, so um, the Matthew, or Exodus chapter twenty. Um, we have the Ten Commandments. Here's Here's this moment in Israel's history where um, they're, they're out and, and out in the desert and they're getting rescued and Moses goes up and he meets with God and has this crazy encounter with them and, and God gives them the Ten Commandments. And you guys maybe used to see the old Moses, I used to watch the old Moses movie on uh, Exodus on TV, you know, he had the big um, tablets of rock and like it was all like scary mountaintop kind of experience. So okay, this, this is this biblical moment here, we have the Ten Commandments, and each one of these though, I, they, they represent what the kingdom of God is like. So let's read the first one. It's kind of in verse 3, it says, you shall, not, you shall have no other gods before me. Now my natural mind when I read this and say, you shall have no other gods before me, then I, I sound like, uh, oh, it's, it's like, this exclusive thing, like, okay, if I have no other gods, then actually, like, like it limits me. I would propose to us here, this, this actually is an amazing, uh, amazing aspect of the kingdom of God. That there is no other gods except for Yahweh, except for God. 
Why is that excellent? Because if we if we begin to understand his character, right? Yesterday was all about the love of the Father. If we begin to understand his character of, of a loving God, if we begin to understand what God it is that we're serving, the God that in Psalms 24 said that he owns everything, if we begin to understand that he's a God that uh, is a God of healing and a God of mercy and a God of grace, then we say, there isn't any other God that we would want to serve. Actually, it's a blessing to us, it's a joy to us to be in a kingdom where he is our God and he's the only one. Because he's a good God. He's the best God. He's the one that we can trade anything for and receive him. I'm like, okay, that, that's actually, before my reaction to it is, oh, that's so limiting. I, what if I miss out on things? But actually, I won't miss out on anything because he has everything I could ever need. That's the kind of God he is. That's the kind of kingdom he, he brings. And the second one, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Yeah, I'm like jealousy. That's like that's like the the big thing, you know. Like you don't want to you don't want to have a relation with somebody a jealous person, right? Like that's like taboo. That's like terrible, right? Why is it, why is this a good thing, God? That I'm, you're not going to allow me to 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 worship any other image. I love this passage in Psalms, and it, and it basically it it basically says that there's people that they they worship created things created by their hands, right? But they can't but it can't see it can't. It can't hear, it can't speak, and it can't move. And so it's just like basically they're worshiping something that they actually created. So it's actually beneath them, but they're worshiping it. So God says, wait a second, no, when you're in my kingdom, actually, you're not going to worship created things. Don't create something that's going to be mystical. Actually, I'm going to be the best thing for you. Again, another kind of reinforcing the first one. I'm going to be the best thing for you. There's nothing that you can create on your own that's going to be greater than me. So don't even bother with it. My kingdom, I, I, my kingdom is going to be a type of kingdom where I'm going to be the greatest thing there is. You're like, oh, that's not practical. No, it, it, he's, he's basically making the statement of who he is. I, I'm the best thing ever. Don't even try, don't even attempt to make something that, that's, that's not like me. I'm the best there is. He's, he's, it's a good thing that he gives to us his commands. Don't even make an image. It's not even worth it. All right, let's go uh, further. What's more understanding his kingdom? Verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord your, the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Another uh, version of this, this commandment says that do not take the Lord your God's name in vain. Now, I, I grew up in a, a good Christian home, and even went to some good Christian schools, right? And cursing was like this really super negative thing. And for a while, a lot of times, people would use this this uh, this verse, and I say, okay, don't curse because it's a really bad thing to do, and you don't want to take the Lord's name in vain. But then as I begin to study, as I begin to see something, a totally different thing. How many of you guys love hypocrites? It's your favorite thing. I love dealing with hypocrites. I hate, I hate that. I hate when I, you know, you meet somebody and they're like totally fake, right? You're like, you get to know them, you're like, man, this is like your one thing here, another thing here. I hate this verse here is, is getting at that exact, that exact type of person. Don't take the name, the, the name of your Lord in vain. Don't, don't mistake the name of the Lord. Don't hold on to them in vain. Why? So his kingdom is one of the, when he is when God steps in his kingdom and his rule, people are real. They don't take the name of the Lord. They, the name of the Lord in vain. They don't take it with 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 the grain of salt. They they take it and they mean it. So in the kingdom, there's real people who who have his real character within them. There there are people that that love and, and are full of compassion and are full of grace. His rule, when his rule came, when his kingdom established, when we're with him, there's no hypocrisy. There's realness. Now, sometimes maybe we we might squirm at that and say, oh man, maybe I'm convicted. I need to work on it myself so that I better represent his name. That in every area of life, I'm representing the name that I've taken. As if I call myself a believer, I call myself a Christian, I take on his name. It carries some weight, I guess, it carries some weight, but it carries some joy. That I want to live a life that's not, not full of hypocrisy, but full of truth. All right, let's look, come on, let's look some more. So, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you will labor and do all your work, and on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
love this. I love it because football is on Sunday and I have to rest. <laughs> and this verse is <laughs> What is the kingdom of God like? The kingdom of God is like there is, there is perfect rest in the kingdom of God. That no longer do I have to strive and work and, 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 and be hard working to earn my, uh, earn my living and earn my position in life. But actually I get to rest in what he's already done. We talked about this a little bit before, right? He, he, does, he, he did the, create, the greatest work, so now I rest in what he did. Especially with Jesus. Jesus conquered it all. He, he did the greatest work. I can't do a better work than Jesus, right? He died on the cross. He took away all the sins, right? But in this, now in his kingdom, though, it's also a place of rest that he actually looks out for me and says, Andrew, be still. Quiet yourself. Rest in me. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Rest. Honor your mother, father. Verse, uh, uh, verse 12. Honor your mother, father. So that you may live long. And all the parents said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> right? Honor, honor your mother's mother. What is it going to be like? I was thinking, what, is it, what does this represent? How does this describe to me the kingdom? Oh, are my parents going to have every say in my life? You know, I have good enough parents. I think I, I would say, okay, well, that, that, that won't be that bad for me. But I, I, I believe this was reflecting the, the honor that we have in relationship. I don't like being another thing. I don't like dis uh, hypocrites. I, I hate being dishonored or belittled. Right? I don't, I don't like it when people don't hold me in, in not not high esteem, but don't don't treat me equal. Right? But so in the kingdom of God, honor your mother and father. There's going to be an honoring in relationship, but there's also going to be, I believe, a respect for wisdom. So there's going to be a desire for wisdom, especially in the Jewish culture. The older the individual was in the community, it also represented the wisdom that they held. So there's going to be, there's not only, I believe, is for instance, like there's an honoring relationship that we have with one another, but also it, it represents that there's going to be an honor of wisdom, that, that wisdom is going to be upheld. There's a lot of foolish things going on in, in the world around us, but in, when the King of God, when our Father reigns and rules and we allow Him to be that in our lives, it's going to be a place where, where we respect wisdom, where we receive wisdom, where foolishness goes on the wayside and wisdom is, is elevated. Thirteen. Good one, we maybe all know this one. You shall not murder. I hate murder. I think God hates murder. But I believe the reason why is because he so loves life. He's one that gives life. He, he said that Jesus said that he comes to give life and he comes to give it more abundantly. So when our God in heaven, our Father in heaven, our, He reigns in His kingdom, there's a, it's a kingdom that values life, that rejoices with life, that encourages life, that, that lifts me up. I, I, love, I love thinking about the restoration that, that Jesus brings and God brings in His kingdom. He brings restoration, He brings life, He rebuilds instead of bringing death and destruction and murder. Another one, uh, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. I'll just say, I don't, I don't like being cheated on. I like the fact that Rachel is faithful to me. I, I like the purity of our, our relationship. I love being in an environment of purity. It, it, it creates, a, it creates a, a safe place in my heart. It creates, um, there's, a, there's a level of trust when they're in, in an environment of purity that doesn't happen outside of the kingdom of God. There's, it says, you shall not commit adultery. In his kingdom, there's, there's a sense of purity that happens that brings security. That only comes when, you, when there's that level of trust. Verse 15, you shall not steal. My possessions are safe. There's a safety in the kingdom of God. There's a safety in the rule of our king, our father. 16, another one I mean, God. You shall not give false testimony against your brother. I hate, I believe, I hate, God hates a spirit of, of gossip, a spirit of falsehood. And I, I don't like being in a work environment when I have to worry about what other people are saying with me, uh, saying about me when I'm not there, right? It, it's, it's a negativity that wells within me when there's falsehood that is around me. But his kingdom, God doesn't say anything false. There's nothing false that comes from our Father in heaven. His kingdom is full of truth. 
I can rejoice in that. It gives me peace. It gives me that allows me, even as we talk about rest, it allows me to be at a place of rest when I know, hey, I can believe what's happening around me. It's okay. It's believable. It, I, there's some different situations that I've been in, and it's like I, I don't even know if the person in front of me, even though they're genuine in their feeling and their expression, whether they're telling the truth to me. I, it's ugh, it's nothing, right? But God says, in my kingdom, it's not going to be falsehood. You're not going to be giving false testimony about it. It's going to be truth that reigns. The last, the last commandment here, I believe how the, how the kingdom is described, says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or, or female servants or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Why is this, oh, why is this established? Because in his kingdom, there is no want. Psalms 24, he has everything, everything in the earth. And, and our, we receive our inheritance. We are, we are heirs to the, to the kingdom just like Jesus is. So we have all of our desires met. That we have no want. So when, it, when I begin to think about the kingdom like this, I begin to understand this Matthew 13 passage. He sold everything so he could get the kingdom. So we could get this thing that was so much better than I currently live in, so much better than my current circumstances. This peace, this truth, this, this freedom, this, this fact that I get him more than anything else. Wow, I want this in my life. Psalms, Psalms 37, 4. It says this. It says that if you take delight in the Lord, that he will give you the desires of your heart. Now I was trying to think, I was trying to think of like, okay, here's some, here's some steps for us to take in order for us to receive the kingdom or receive God's uh, reign in our life. And I was like, okay, well, you know, all, all good, all good um, ministers encourage us to read your Bible. I, I put that on here, read your Bible. Or the other one I put on here was like join fellowship. I know at Cap City Church, we love our missional communities and, and we have missional communities that meet throughout the week. And I was, I was like, okay, I can encourage everybody, you know, join a fellowship and we can encourage one another to continue growing in Jesus. And I was like, okay, another good pastoral thing I could say would be, you know, hey, spend some time in prayer so that when in, in prayer you will receive more from, from our Heavenly Father. You receive the kingdom of God. And I thought, you know, all those things I think are really good. So do those things. They, they'll, I think they'll help out in us receiving the kingdom. But I believe one, the one essential part in this, in this whole aspect of the kingdom of God, when it comes back down to the um, Matthew 13, you know, he sold, he sold all of his possessions, he sold anything that, that, um, that even cost value to him. He, he counted it joy, he wanted to receive this, right? He goes back to this Psalm 37 4. Take the light of the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's not so much a kingdom of God being a, a following God as our, our king. It's not so much a just what we do kind of thing. It's an issue of our heart. Where is our heart? You know, I, I another instance I was thinking about, I was thinking about those moments in which you ever lost your keys. Mm. The panic comes over you, right? You gotta leave. I was supposed to leave five minutes ago, now I gotta find my keys. I'm like, I turn over the whole house, and it never fails. I'll turn over the whole house to find my keys. All I gotta do is ask Rachel, and she's like, "Oh yeah, they're right there." But <laughs> that intensity of that moment when we're when we're looking and we're searching for our keys, it's like, and no, nothing else matters because now I'm ten minutes late. You know, I gotta get these keys, right? That's kind of, I think, the tenacity that that, that represents is the tenacity that we have when we're going after the, the kingdom, the things. When we're, when we're going after him, hey, we're allowing him to rule and reign in our lives. You know what? No matter, no matter what, at any cost, you know, I'm going to get the kingdom. I'm going to, I'm going to receive your will reign. Because God, I'm, this is what, this is the, this is what it, for me, it tells, I'm telling God. It, you know what, God, to me, receiving from you is more valuable than any other thing in the moment. I want, I want from you more than any other thing, that no matter, you know, I love Rachel, and no matter how, how, how much I desire to grow in our relationship, I mean, God, I desire to grow with you. I want your kingdom. And today, what I was saying, I kind of 
kind of almost took a break from the whole the whole series on God as our Father because I just felt like this burning inside of me to to encourage us as a body, as a body of believers, Capital City Church, whether, or, or even individually as a, as a believer and a follower of Jesus, to trade everything and go after the kingdom. That's basically what I was hearing this, morning, over, or this week as I was studying over and over again. Trade everything, no matter what, it, what it's going to cost you, get the kingdom. It's going to be better for you. And, and, and I'm just like, uh, what, does that, what does that mean, Andrew? What, how, does it, how does that look? And, and I think it would look like, hey, we're, we're, I'm, I want to be in the Word more. I want to be in the fellowship more. I want to be praying more. I think it's going to look like that, but it's going to begin with, in my heart, I want to say, you know what? God, I, I've, I've begun to see your character, and you are so much better than anything I have. And I'm going to, I'm going to get you. I want to get it. I want to get you. Know, I want to, I want to, I want to search after it. I want to seek it. No matter where I can find it, I want to get it. You know, sometimes I can look back on my life and different, different times in my life where I said you know, I was just like all out going for the kingdom. And I would, I would go listen to podcasts all week long. I would, what I was like, whatever I could get to get the kingdom, I was like going for it. You know, if it cost me whatever to go to go on mission, I would just do it because I just wanted to be in love with my father. I wanted to receive from him. It was it brought me such peace. It brought me such comfort. It brought me such joy. It brought me man, I mean like I used to even do crazy things. I used to do crazy experiments experiments when I was when I was younger and, and stuff. I'd be like, I wanna I wanna test and see how it will feel this week if I if I if I go after God this week and see how like my interaction with my family go or my relationship. I'm like a really nerdy kind of science guy, I, I guess. And I would like I would even journal sometimes like, hey, this week I, I did this I did this much to go after God and this was the results of, of what it was like. And I'm telling you, like I know it's just my geekiness, but every time, like every time I was spending time with God, every time I was seeking after him, I received his kingdom. I received his peace. I received his love. Like I experienced him more. And I directed my life towards him. It just, I mean, like, I don't know how to, I can't like, break it down and explain it. It just happened. It's just, when you seek after him, the kingdom, like this, like this story, he said, I want to sell everything that's not even worth it. I'm just going to go, go for broke. You receive it, and it's always good. It always turns out better for us. So this morning, I, I just want to invite us to, to have a time of, of response, of like, hey, what is my decision for me? As, as we begin to seek God, the, last week as our Father, this good Father who loves us, as we see Him this morning, even in the, in the commandment, as we as we broken down and saying, actually these weren't commandments that brought change to us, they were for commandments for our good. They actually brought good things into our life. It's a good thing that people aren't around that He didn't uphold murdering. Like, I'm, I'm glad that He protected my life. I'm glad that he said, hey, you know what? There's no other God besides me. Come and worship me. Because when I when I do, I receive him. And it's amazing. I'm, I'm glad that he talked about honoring my parents. That there's a, there's a blessing that comes when I honor my parents. There's a blessing that comes when I honor relationships. There's a blessing that comes when there's a there's an environment of, of purity and trust. It's good for me. So this morning, uh, why don't we all bow our heads? I want to I just pray for a moment. And I believe... I believe today is going to be, I really felt this this week, that today is going to be a decision point. It, it, of, of, am, I, am I going to go for, I use the, my way, am I going to go broke for the kingdom? Am I going to go for the kingdom and nothing less? I just want, I want you, Father. I want you in my life. Your reign in my life is better than anything else I've experienced. You know, so sometimes we can be honest with God. I, I like being honest with God and I tell him, um, I tell them this, I say, God, you know, help my unbelief. Sometimes I have a hard time believing, God, your, your kingdom is better. Your, your reign in my life, your fatherhood over my life, your authority in my life. Sometimes I have a hard time believing it's better. But, Father, help my unbelief in this moment that I can, that I can go for you and nothing else. What's really awesome yesterday was, um, as we talked about the father heart of God, was this story of the prodigal son. It's a Maybe a familiar, familiar parable. But the prodigal son, he, he got his inheritance, got everything he wanted from his father, he asked for it, and then he went out and he just spent it away. He wasted it. Found himself actually eating and eating pigs, uh, pigs food in the pig pen. 
And we finally realized, you know what, it would be better, it actually would be better for me if I could return to my father and if he could just, if he could let me even be a servant in his house, you know, that would be better than if I were sitting here and eating the, the mess of the pigs. And Ted brought up this really powerful point. That the son in the pig pen actually didn't understand the heart of his father. He didn't even realize how good the heart of his father was. Because when, when the prodigal son, when he came, when he was coming back to the father, the father saw him off in a distance, and it says he actually he ran to him. You know, at that moment, of course, as a son, you're like you're thinking, okay, oh yeah, I'll just I mean, I'll take the lowest position in your house, father. But no, the father actually he lavished love on him in that moment. He actually restored him completely. He gave him he gave him a ring on his finger that represented the family the family seal. He put a robe on him. He, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go slaughter the, the, the fattest cow and I'm gonna have a party for you. Cause because you've come home. And I was just thinking about that. I was like, wow. That's the kind of that's the kind of father we have, that's the kind of king we have. He, he's excited when we make the decision, hey, I'm gonna go all out for you. I'm gonna I'm gonna get the kingdom, nothing else. Offer you. In this moment, I just want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to be quiet here for a moment, but I want to give you an opportunity in your heart. Say, God, I want nothing else but your kingdom. Some of you may be able to see that real quickly. You're just like,
pray that it's been closed today. Father, I thank you that you are, you're doing a good thing. Doing a good thing. And, and, and I, I, we celebrate what you are doing in our lives. You're calling us forward. You're calling us into more. You're revealing yourself to us day by day, week by week. Father, I pray that, that each one of us would begin to, or, or continue to experience that refreshing, that newness that you bring into our lives as we seek after you with all that we got. Father, we thank you for encouraging us through Matthew 13 today, that uh, just that image of somebody going and selling their greatest possessions, selling all their possessions, and, and just getting in the kingdom. God, they, were, they, were, they were getting you. So, Father, I pray for each one that, that raised their hand, or, and each one even that didn't, Father, that, that, that they would seek after you, that they would go after you, God, with all that they got. Because your reign is so good. Father, your authority is so excellent. It's so refreshing, God. Lord, I pray that you would increase in each one of us faith to believe that we go after you and, and that you have our best interest in mind. Father, thank you uh, that we're family, and I pray that this week we would grow even and encourage one another. Father, that you would give us moments that during the week that we can call one another up or uh, message one another and, and be able to encourage one another to continue to seek after all that you have for us. Father, I bless your people with the revelation of more of you. In Jesus' name.